Lockheed Martin, we're on a mission. Your mission. When millions of people are counting on you, you can count on us. To build the impossible, to invent the inconceivable, and solve every problem with speed and reliability. Every mission is an expedition of the greatest importance, both to you and to us. Good afternoon, I'm Pete Daly, CEO and publisher of the U.S. Naval Institute, and I welcome all of our members and guests to the 148th annual meeting. I hope our members, friends, and your families have weathered the COVID storm unscathed thus far and are doing great as we emerge from all this. What a past 14 months it has been. We will do Q&A at the end of my remarks and at the end of our keynote speaker's remarks. And to ask a question, please use the Ask a Question tool on your screen. This year's annual meeting is made possible by the generous support of Lockheed Martin and Leonardo DRS. I especially want to acknowledge Vice Admiral Tom Roden, Vice Admiral Al Myers, Captain Mike Salvedo, Captain Robbie Harris, and Captain Glenn Sears, all Navy retired, representing Lockheed Martin. And we also wish to acknowledge the generous contribution of Leonardo DRS, represented by Michael Coulter and Joe Militano. We thank them for helping us make this event possible and for their continued support. New since the last annual meeting as we hail one of our newly elected board members, Mr. Mel Immergood. We also hail one new appointed board member, Lieutenant James Barksdale, U.S. Navy. We also hail our new active duty liaisons, Rear Admiral Fred Kacher, U.S. Navy, and Rear Admiral Scott Clendenin, U.S. Coast Guard. Our board members volunteer their time without compensation, and we're very grateful for their time and efforts. The leadership of the Honorable Bob Work as chair and Admiral John Greenert as vice chair has been instrumental in weathering challenges over the past year. We thank the following board members of the Board of Directors who have completed their service. Directors who ended service in the past year are Mr. Philip Bilden. Philip currently serves on the Naval Academy Foundation and is a chair, is the chair of the Naval War College Foundation. The Honorable Kathleen Hicks. Dr. Hicks is now Deputy Secretary of Defense. She's a busy person. And Commander Guy Snodgrass, U.S. Navy retired. Guy continues as a proceedings contributor and you can see his superb Naval Aviation and Weapons in Review in the May issue of Proceedings. We'd also like to thank our departing board liaisons, Rear Admiral Charles B. Brad Cooper. Brad was just promoted to Vice Admiral and commands the Fifth Fleet, another busy person. And also Rear Admiral Doug Fears, U.S. Coast Guard. Doug is now a two-star and currently serves as Director Jayadif South. Again, these are volunteer board positions and our Directors generously give their time and support to advance the Institute's mission. The editorial board is vital to the credibility of our open forum. All the members are active duty, and they do this work above and beyond their primary jobs in the Navy, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard. And their active duty perspective provides us an indispensable reality check and invaluable course guidance for proceedings. Special shout out to Ed Board Chair Commander Brendan Stickles for his leadership in this year of all years. Newly elected to the Ed Board are Lieutenant Commander Michelle Foster, U.S. Coast Guard, and Lieutenant Andrea Howard, U.S. Navy. Congratulations to them. And we thank the members of our editorial board who have left since the 2020 annual meeting. Commander Eric McQueen, U.S. Navy. Lieutenant Commander Ryan Mewitt, U.S. Navy. Lieutenant Commander Natalia Best, Coast Guard. Major Nick Brunetti Lehach, Marine Corps, and Chief Warrant Officer Chuck Shipley, Coast Guard. Their service to the Institute made us better, for which we are most grateful. Our Naval Institute Foundation trustees have done extra work the past few years as part of our first ever comprehensive capital campaign. It was ambitious, and despite obstacles such as the high cost of construction in our geographic area and the global pandemic, we are inches away from reaching our complete campaign goals. Special recognition for General Pete Pace for his positive encouragement to me personally and to the staff. There were headwinds and he faced all with superb leadership, style, and wit. We are fortunate to have an accomplished group of advisors to draw upon for advice on naval history and we're most grateful. And I want to make special mention of Jim Hornfisher who was very seriously ill. 
Jim is a New York Times bestselling author and naval historian amongst his many professional accomplishments. Jim frequently relied on the Naval Institute's oral history collection, using those first-person accounts to breathe real life into his narrative, capturing the drama, the sacrifice, and the heroism of that titanic existential struggle in the Pacific in a way that was riveting and rang true to all those who have gone down to the sea in ships. Jim, Jim was <clears throat> has honored us by bringing his story of the tin can sailors at the battle off Samar to our Dead Reckoning graphic novel series, helping to ensure that the valor and sacrifice displayed off Samar will never be forgotten. We look forward to publishing it later this year. The next issue of our Naval History magazine will pay tribute to Jim's towering work, a fitting tribute to a man who a reviewer once called the Dean of World War II Naval History. On Monday, Jim received well-deserved award recognition from the Department of the Navy, receiving the Distinguished Civilian Service Award. And Jim, we're all thinking of you and your entire family tonight. New for 2021 is the American Sea Power Project that started in January and will continue throughout this year and into 2022. It continues the Naval Institute's long legacy of thought leadership related to naval power. And from time to time, the global security environment, alliances, and technolo technological shifts are significant enough that we need to re-examine the underlying principles of sea power and what the U.S. Sea Services must accomplish and how these strategic principles should guide everything from acquisition to force structure to deployments to education and operational art. We see this project as critical to the future health of the sea services. And it's a debate not just for the Navy, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard professionals, but also for the American public and the national political leaders. We're moving the debate from the pages of proceedings to the stage of the Jack C. Taylor Conference Center and other venues later this year. We did our first virtual event on 22 April, and more events will follow. One of the most important attributes of the Institute is the power to convene. Construction of the Jack C. Taylor Conference Center continues to give, to, continues and will give us a home field, and we expect to be substantially complete within a few weeks. I'll show some recent images to give you a feel for the progress of the physical construction, and every day we realize the beauty of the design. Walking through the images here, the front of the addition has come together very well, and the new approach will provide recognition beyond that which the Institute has previously had on the Naval Academy yard. The masonry walls, outside curved masonry stairway, atrium glass, kugel ball, and the canopy on the terrace all look terrific, and it'll look even better when the front plaza is complete. This shows more views from the top and from the side, and I'm very impressed with the group Tents and Strength Structures in Baltimore that designed, engineered, and fabricated and installed this distinctive feature. The indoor-outdoor structure will allow for both open-air events and can also be enclosed, heated, and cooled. It's an ideal venue in any weather. And walking into the atrium space gives you a nice sense of height and dimension. The atrium is the connection between Beach Hall and the auditorium and the connection between the old and the new. And you can see here the 406-seat Lockheed Martin Auditorium, the tall ceiling, curved design, millwork, and lighting make it feel grand. And the main LED screen will be installed in early June. It'll be terrific to see the main display, hear the surround sound, and appreciate the excellent acoustics within a few short weeks. The meeting or breakout rooms look super, and it's hard to believe how these first deck spaces have transformed from the dingy spaces that were there before. It looks terrific. Now you could see the views of the first deck renovation and the progress continues as we, you look at the Huntington Ingalls Industries Grand Foyer. And the installation of the overhead lights combined with the natural light that, that it comes in from the atrium and the entry foyer gives this space dimension and depth. And the Institute's mission work and history will be featured on visually interesting and educational displays throughout the center. You could see the completion of the large second deck meeting room that Fred and Diane Smith of FedEx named in honor of Medal of Honor recipient, Lieutenant Commander Vincent Capadano, Chaplain Corps, U.S. Navy. The broadcast studio and galley center that services the second deck meeting room are close to complete. The broadcast studio is already in use because I'm standing right in it coming to you live tonight. We removed the existing skylights and installed a new level paper system on the 
William D. Hauser Battle of Midway Memorial Terrace, and it has a wonderful view of the Severn River and the Naval Academy. In this final image, you'll see the interior renovation progress at the third deck level in the atrium, you see the sky bridge, new elevator, and a great shot of the stairway and location of the celestial wall where we'll recognize our founding donors against the backdrop of a celestial map from the day of our founding on 9 October 1873. We launched the Naval Institute's first ever comprehensive campaign late in 2017, and it was supposed to last three years. Who knew that year three would coincide with a worldwide pandemic? So we've extended into stoppage time. Over the past year, we've been at a critical point to raise the remaining funds required for our largest ever capital project, in addition to raising the usual requirements for annual support. The Institute relies on approximately $5 million in annual support to invest in all aspects of our mission work, proceedings, naval history, the Naval Institute Press, USNI News, oral histories, events, and other naval heritage initiatives, including digitizing all our content. And we're grateful to all our members, donors, foundations, and corporations that have made an investment in us at this critical juncture. We've raised the required funds for the construction and outfitting of the Jack C. Taylor Conference Center, and I'll show you where we stand on that in a moment. And we're just inches away from meeting our overall campaign goal of just under $44 million. We urge all our members to take a moment and make a gift to support our mission critical work and get us over the top of the campaign goal. As I mentioned, we've reached our construction and outfitting goal for the center, and we thank all those who have made a contribution to the success of this project. And while we celebrate this key success, we pivot to ensuring there is maintenance and tech refresh fund to ensure the building is well maintained and the technology is current and user friendly over the entire life of the conference center. One way to get involved now is to purchase a brick for your donor wall or a chair inside the auditorium. And both are wonderful opportunities to honor or memorialize your commitment to the sea services or someone that you choose to honor while being a tax deductible gift. Commitments received before the end of July will be installed for the dedication and grand opening celebration in September and you can visit usni.org forward slant foundation to make sure your gift is in. Virtual conferences and events provide an opportunity to broaden and increase our reach. And one significant benefit of the advent of the virtual events this year, this past year, is that we've been able to reach a global audience. Our Maritime Security Dialogue event series normally draws 150 to 250 people in person. However, we've had upwards of 3,000 attendees at some of our events due to the virtual format, including far off visitors from Australia, Europe, and Asia. We hosted an event in partnership with the Coast Guard Academy in November with General Dempsey as the featured speaker. And not only did we have the Corps of Cadets, which is our target audience for that event, but we also had 400 Naval Institute members attend. In previous years, we wouldn't have been able to do that. And this is an example of what's happened over the past year. We've delivered high quality professional conferences and events in a virtual format. And in a world where we're spending so much time online, we learned that production quality of virtual events is very important to keep attendees engaged. We strove to feature the same caliber of speakers that we would have had at in-person at in events. We had the chairman, the CNO, and the Commandant of the Marine Corps speak at our Virtual Defense Forum Washington Conference in December. That had over 1,100 attendees participate in real time. West 2021 will take place virtually and the engaging content you've enjoyed in person will be showcased over two days from June 29th to June 30. As always, West is free for military and government and Naval Institute members receive a significant discount on registration. And the West theme is, what is the promise and the progress of Naval integration? Go to www.westconference.org to register and view the full program. We made excellent progress at the Naval Institute in our reach in 2020. And you see here in these charts that we had 30 plus percent gains in proceedings and on usni.org. We had a 46% increase in USNI News. All of this averages up to a 36% plus up year on year in terms of reach and readership. We're seeing a good dispersion in our readership among the age groups depicted here. Uh, importantly, we saw a 2% increase in 2019 uh, from 2019 to 2020 in the 18 to 24 group, a 
which is an important group for us. The tools that we have now allow us to understand who's reading, whom we are reaching much better than before, and it's encouraging. These tools also show the location of the viewer. And 2020 saw a significant growth of international readers. Europe and Asia are up 14% and 13% respectively from 2019. We signed a MOU with the World of Warships and have now extended our collaboration with them for another few years. The monthly portal articles and photo essays drive interest in our content. And we see a positive correlation between featured products and sales. The Naval Institute History Special Editions, the press is doing, are the first products to feature World of Warships content. Now is the Naval Institute Press. We met the NROTC and JNROTC COVID-driven demand for digital textbooks. We're nearing completion of the revised 26th edition of the Blue Jackets Manual that will publish in 2022. We launched the project for the next revision of the Naval Institute Guide to Ships and Aircraft of the U.S. Fleet. Pictured here is the cover of a quiet cadence. NIP author and USNA grad Mark Trainer recently received the 2021 William E. Colby Award from Norwich, sponsored by the Pritzker Military Foundation. And this is a significant recognition for his book. 2020 was a big year for USNI News. Days after returning from West, USNI News transitioned into a completely remote newsroom with reporters working across the East Coast, keeping day-to-day -day tabs not only on how the fleet was adjusting to the global pandemic, but also keeping tabs of the seismic shifts in Navy leadership. While other newsrooms covering the sea service furloughed their reporters, USNI News doubled down and kept providing essential information for the wider public. The pace of the coverage saw the site traffic grow by more than 46%, as I mentioned, and we are now up to 20 million page views for 2019 and even more for 2021. We're ahead of the pace. We're also attracting younger readers and more women in 2020 over 2019. In July, we brought aboard Mallory Shelbourne as a new senior staff writer who's already done some great work, including breaking news about the Navy's search for the next strike fighter and an update on the Gerald R. Ford. USNI News has also published an award-winning story on the carrier readiness shortfall that has slowly built in the service for the past 20 years. Megan Eckstein received important recognition from the Military Repiter Reporters Editors 2021 for her, normal 20, for her November 2020 article, No Margin Left, Overworked Carrier Force Struggles to Maintain Deployments After Decades of Overuse. Building on a database of deployments originally built in 2018, the story led by Megan Eckstein at the end of 2020 showed in stark detail the impact that all this has had on the carrier force. Well done, Megan. Well done to the USNI News team. We'll now, tradition, we'll now transition to audience Q&A. And again, a reminder, you can use the Ask a Question tool on your screen um, to ask a question. OK, the first question, the first question is, is from Jerry Roncolato. Is the conference center going to host Naval Institute events exclusively? And if others can use it, what other uses do you foresee and by whom? Well, thanks, Jerry, for uh, asking this question. And uh, let, me, let me just go down the list here. First, uh, we hope that the conference center becomes a real asset for the Department of the Navy and all the military and the rest of government. So we've built in free uses uh, in, our, in our agreement to use this building and to build the conference center for the Naval Academy and the Navy to use, and the Marines to use the conference center. Uh, secondly, we also have the right to show this as a, to use this as a venue for corporate uh, and defense corporate and also for other military above the Naval Academy. For instance, if folks at Fort Meade want to show up, they can show up. COCOMs, the intelligence community, um, the, the Hill, Congress. We see real value in people coming over from DC, it's about 30 miles away, getting away from their inbox and using this facility. 
It'll also be available for individuals who want to rent space. But the primary focus really on the whole conference center was to do professional events and hold professional symposia. And uh, so just to recap, it's Naval Institute, it's corporate, it's other entities uh, north of the Naval Academy who are military, COCOMs, the intelligence community, the works. Okay. Other questions? Okay, here's another question that's just come in, which is, how is the Naval Institute doing right now with respect to reaching younger audiences and what are you doing what are you doing to find new ways to reach them well i'd say the most important didn't have a name on that one but the most important way uh, that we reach new audiences is through our essay contests and through our conferences and events uh, we've really worked hard to expand the titles the themes for the essay contests and to make sure and to make sure that we've got uh, enough outlets to find the talent out there. Let me give you an example. You know, in, since the beginning of the Institute, uh, essay contests have been an extremely important part of, of what we do. And now, we're up to about seven to eight contests, and that's where we've really identified the new talent. You know, we've got groups such as the Young Leaders Group, uh, led by J.D. Christensen and formerly by Fred Kacher, and those groups are great. But we want to make sure that everybody gets a chance to publish. And frankly, I think, to brag on our staff for a moment, I think our editors do the best job of working with new authors and allowing them a chance to publish. So the essay contests identify new talent. The essay contests are a lower barrier to entry than I think most for what military people are facing. This is the best door to walk through. And uh, that's it. I think it's that and the events. Okay, other questions? Let's see if anything comes in here. Okay, other questions? All right, well, I think we're gonna take a short break here and uh, we'll take a short break uh, just for a moment while we transition to our, our keynote speaker. And uh, if you've got another question, let it roll. Otherwise, we're out for a break, thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Adam Kane, the Director of Naval Institute Press. I have the pleasure today to announce our 2020 Naval Institute Press Author of the Year. This annual award is given to the author whose book shapes our fundamental understanding of a maritime, military, or national security related topic. The 2020 Naval Institute Press Author of the Year is Skip Finley, whose book Whaling Captains of Color, America's First Meritocracy, tells the remarkable stories of more than 50 black whaling captains whose exploits on the high seas offered a dramatic alternative to life on the 19th century mainland. Timely and engaging, Skip's work explores an industry where merit mattered as much or more than race and family connections. Through the exploration of the lives of these captains and the whaling industry that provided them with their opportunities, Whaling Captains of Color brings to the forefront an important and heretofore overlooked aspect of our maritime past. Here to accept the award is Skip Finley. Hi, I'm Skip Finley, and I'm grateful for this honor from the Naval Institute Press. The book results from my surprise that a black person could have been captain of anything during the years of slavery and was generated by my curiosity in finding out how that could have happened. I'm gratified the book portrays their achievement despite the obstacles they faced. In the most literal sense, this wouldn't have been possible without, and thank you, to Carol Sargent of Georgetown University, who promoted the book to Laura DeVoulis who was then my acquisition editor. Thanks also to Glenn Griffith, 
who saw the book through to completion. A particular warm thank you to copy editor Mindy Connor, who helped establish a cohesive narrative, and the rest of the press's staff, Jacqueline Barnes, Robin Noonan, Jack Russell, and Caitlin Bing, without whom my work might not have been as widely received. Thank you, Adam Kame, for notifying me about this wonderful acknowledgement, and of course, everyone at the Academy in Annapolis. I hope we can extend the life of the title to several ancillary projects I have planned. Until then, most humbly, thank you. I will now turn it over to Eric Mills, who will announce the Authors of the Year for Naval History Magazine. Hello, I'm Eric Mills, Editor-in-Chief of Naval History Magazine. You know, over the years, we've been honored to have the most eminent names in the field of naval history appear in our magazine. And while we always welcome these distinguished bylines in our table of contents, we love it best when they appear alongside the bylines of the up-and-comers, the emerging talents, those who are the very ones who will be keeping the torch lit as time goes on. One such rising star is Dr. Mark R. Fulce, and we are pleased to present him with the Naval History 2020 Author of the Year Award. Dr. Fulce is a military and naval historian who specializes in Marine Corps history. He taught Navy and Marine Corps history at the U.S. Naval Academy from 2018 to 2020, and is currently a military historian at the Center for Military History in Washington, D.C. CMH is lucky to have you, Mark, and we've been lucky to have you in our pages as well. In his February 2020 article, The Common Will Triumphant, Dr. Fulce commemorated the 75th anniversary of the Battle of Iwo Jima by exploring how the Corps and the American public continue to draw inspiration from the Marines' heavy sacrifice and ultimate victory there. In his August 2020 article, The Revolutionary Tenure of Commandant Lejeune, the author gave due credit to the legendary John A. Lejeune for his groundbreaking efforts to elevate the service's prestige among the American public. And if I may indulge in a bit of a teaser preview, Mark's upcoming article in the August 2021 issue it's the cover story, in fact. Promises to be a real barn burner. Be watching for it. But now, here to accept his award is Mark Fulce. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for the honor of being the 2020 uh, Naval History Author of the Year. It, this was wonderful news that I got. Um, pats on the back don't come often in this business. And when they do, I am very, very grateful. Thank you to Eric Mills. Thank you to Bill Hamlet and everybody at USNI and Naval History for this wonderful opportunity and this distinct honor. I was asked to write both articles, um, the first one being on uh, Iwo Jima in 1945 and Lejeune in 1920. Both are kind of legacy pieces that explore the legacy of both. Uh, regarding Iwo Jima, I looked at tradition, mission, and public opinion and how the battle influenced both of the, all three of those things for the Marine Corps. Uh, and for Lejeune, I talk about a lot of the same issues that the Marine Corps is facing today. I talked about Lejeune and educational reform. I talked about Lejeune and mission development, uh, doctrinal development, and all that other kind of stuff. Lejeune is very much the reason why Quantico is still the intellectual hub of the Marine Corps. Um, and I, I was hoping that I would get a good readership from these two articles. And one thing I've learned from publishing at USNI is that if you publish something on Marine Corps history, Marines will give it a look. And they will give you your opinion on things if you say something that they disagree with. And I just love that about writing for Marines. They are a very, very engaged audience. They, as, as a group, they care a lot about what is being written about their institution. Uh, and so writing for Naval History was a great way for me to reach that audience. Um, regarding the importance of writing, it's very, very important for what I do as an academic. And I know it's very, very important for what military professionals do. Uh, we both deal with very, very complex, complicated, big issues, and those issues have to be researched well. They have to be thought about uh, f uh, for a long period for long periods of time. They have to gestate for long periods of time, and we have to be able to break those issues down into their simple, clear parts, and be able to synthesize and bring that all back together into a coherent, clear, and concise fashion so audiences could read them. What's the point of learning all this stuff if you can't? Uh, teach it to someone else, uh, or at least communicate it to someone else. So it, writing is very, very important. And for those, uh, those of you out there, to men and women in the military or young academics who are interested in publishing with Naval History or USNI or Marine Corps History or the Journal of Military History, there is no secret formula uh, in terms of uh, professional writing. 
the only thing I can really say to do is to read, 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 and write, write, write. That's it. Um, the more you read, the more you'll learn, the more you'll learn, the more you'll uh, have to say. Uh, and writing is a skill that it's like a mus muscle that we all have to work and flex and, pr and it, good writing comes with practice. Um, and also good writing comes from being able to work with your editors. Uh, I had really great edi uh, editing done with both of these articles. I had uh, peers that were willing to read them for me and look and look through them and find mistakes at the Naval Academy. And the, the editors that I worked with at Naval History were very, very professional. They gave me some really great advice. They really helped me clean up my writing. So read, 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 write, 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 and listen to your editors. They know what they're talking about. Uh, and with that, I'll, I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you all very much. I wish I could be there in person, but such is COVID times. Uh, thanks again. Semper Fi. Thank you, Mark. And congratulations again from the entire staff of Naval History Magazine. And now I'll turn things over to Bill Hamlet, who will announce the author of the year for proceedings, as well as our general prize essay contest winners. Over to you, Captain. Good afternoon, I'm Bill Hamlet, Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings. Today I have the pleasure of announcing the 2020 Proceedings Author of the Year and the winners of the General Prize Essay Contest. The Proceedings Author of the Year is Captain Walker Mills, United States Marine Corps. In 2020, Captain Mills was prolific in the pages of Proceedings. His insightful work appeared in more than half our issues last year with five feature articles, a Nobody Asked Me But, a Now Hear This, and several book reviews. Although a Marine, Walker writes about all the sea services and has a great understanding of how the sea services can and should work together. In a year when naval integration was a main focus for the Navy, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard, Captain Mills was on point. I can also add from an editor's perspective that Walker is a pleasure to work with. I will now turn it over to Captain Mills. Congratulations, Walker. Hi, I'm Captain Walker Mills, uh, and I'm honored to be the USNI Proceedings 2020 Author of the Year. Um, I'm a Marine Corps Infantry Officer, and I work here in Cartagena, Colombia, at the Colombian Naval Academy, La Escuela Naval de Cadetes Almirante Padilla. Um, of, of the different essays that I wrote for Proceedings this year, my favorite was one co-authored with Eric Lindbacher called Sustainment Will Be Contested that we wrote for the 2020, for the November 2020 issue of Proceedings. And we wrote uh, about contested naval logistics uh, in, in the Pacific, um, and we used the example of Guadalcanal from the, from the Japanese perspective to show the high price of failure um, when logistics uh, aren't right for expeditionary forces. Uh, during the battle, uh, thousands or, or, or tens of thousands of Japanese um, possibly died of, of starvation and exposure because they weren't able to be supplied uh, by the Imperial Japanese Navy. And at the same time, uh, Marines and soldiers uh, were able to uh, eat fairly well and, and enjoy special meals at, at Christmas and Thanksgiving. Um, and I, I so want to thank Eric again for, for co-authoring me and also uh, thank the other authors, uh, Dylan and Trevor, Trevor Phillips Levine um, and Joshua Taylor that, that co-authored pieces with me in, in proceedings this year. You know, I'm a big believer that uh, collaborative writing always yields better results than, uh, than writing by yourself. Um, and I think that this year, uh, at this time in, in, in the Marine Corps, it's especially important to write um, and, and get your two cents out there uh, or, or kind of forever hold your peace because we're at an inflection point um, in the service. And I think a lot of decisions are being made now that are going to shape the future of the service. Um, and lastly, I just want to uh, recognize everyone who, uh, who wasn't able to write this year because they were dealing with effects of the, um, the pandemic, whether it was uh, staying at home uh, with children or, or taking care of loved ones. Um, so we look forward to reading uh, what, what you and, and what they have to write uh, this year or, or next. Um, and thank you again. The next awardees are the winners of the 2020 General Prize Essay Contest, all three of which appear in the May proceedings. Every year, I look forward to the winning essays from this, our oldest and most prestigious contest, Past winners include Lieutenant Ernest J. King in 1909, Lieutenant Commander and later Senator Sam Stratton, Lieutenant Commanders Jim Stavridis and Sandy Winnefeld, and Captain Dale Relog. I also want to express our sincere thanks to Andrew and Barbara Taylor 
for funding the general prize essay contest. Their support is an investment in the open forum and in ideas that help transform the Navy, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard. This year's third prize winner is Coast Guard Chief Petty Officer Philip Null. His article, The Fallacy of Presence, is a fascinating look at the limitations of presence operations when not backed up by hard power. Chief Null has placed in several of our contests in the past few years and will be joining the editorial board of the Naval Institute next month. Over to you, Chief Null. Greetings, fellow Naval Institute members. I'm Chief Boston Mate Philip Null, the Executive Petty Officer at Coast Guard Station Jonesport, Maine. I'm humbled by the selection of my essay titled The Fallacy of Gray Zone Strategy as a winner in this year's general prize contest. Working to police disputed waters under current legal and policy frameworks is a near futile task, one that I've experienced firsthand as the Gulf of Maine Gray Zone is only a few nautical miles from where I stand. Though I have no expectations that this essay will end the centuries-long dispute over the U.S.-Canadian border in this region, I do hope it raises awareness of the realities of gray zone operations and causes senior leaders and legislators to work toward creating real consequences for malign conduct so that we might be better positioned as a nation to gain the advantage at sea. Without the platform provided by the Naval Institute, this issue and others that I've written on may never have gained the visibility of decision makers positioned to make a real difference. Without the work and strong advocacy of leaders like retired Master Chief Paul Kingsbury, Enlisted personnel such as myself I never have learned of the Institute, much less penned articles that inform and challenge the services. The Institute has my lifelong support, and I'll challenge myself and others to continue to read, write, think, and speak in its forum. Thank you again for all your support. Semper Paratus. Lieutenant Commander Evan Karlick, U.S. Navy, took second prize with diving off the platform-centric mindset. In this article, Commander Karlick points out that the software loads on Navy ships must be more easily upgraded, like the software on our smartphones. Commander Karlick, the virtual stage is yours. Good afternoon. This is Lieutenant Commander Evan Karlick in Arlington, Virginia, and I'd like to extend a deep thank you to the United States Naval Institute, the editorial board, and contest judges for recognizing my essay and its recommendations. My piece begins by contrasting the two most noteworthy acquisition documents the Navy and the Air Force each released last year, namely the Navy's 30-year shipbuilding plan versus Dr. Will Roper's matrix-themed treatise on digital acquisition. From this comparison, I go on to argue that the persistent, animated, and rather public conversation about the Navy's future force structure is depriving oxygen and distracting us from the preparations we need to be making for the coming era of algorithmic warfare in which specific ship types and totals will matter far less than whether these ships can rapidly update their software and supporting data. Automation and artificial intelligence will overwhelmingly determine the pace of conflict and the force with the most hardened, resilient, cooperative and adaptable algorithms will possess the decisive advantage. Our focus needs to be on driving down the time required to push the latest software to our sailors at the tactical edge. I wouldn't have arrived at these perspectives if not for assignments to a joint acquisition program, to an intelligence community agency, and to an incredible year-long legislative fellowship in the House of Representatives. I'm grateful to Navy leaders for offering these types of broadening career experiences. The cross-pollination that occurs in these roles and the opportunities we're each presented to contribute to the ecosystem of ideas are so important to junior officer development. Thank you for watching and thank you for reading. Finally, this year's first place winner in the General Prize Essay Contest is a name familiar to proceedings readers over the past 30 years. Captain Sam Tangretti, U.S. Navy retired is the director of the Institute for Future Warfare Studies at the Naval War College and an author who is gifted at taking complicated topics and making them easier to understand in an operational context. In Sun Tzu versus AI, why artificial intelligence can fail in great power competition, Sam cuts through a lot of the hype surrounding artificial intelligence and questions the popular wisdom that AI will transform warfare. Not so fast, he points out. AI is great in commercial applications, but what happens when the enemy purposefully contaminates data coming through our sensors? 
Sam also won this contest 20 years ago in 2000 when it was called the Arleigh Burke Essay Contest. I'll turn it over now to Captain Tangretti. It's an honor to be chosen for this award, and I thank every member of the Naval Institute for their support over the years to the Naval Institute and particularly to proceedings. Your support is vital to shaping the future of the Navy. And that's not just rhetoric. In reality, not a single idea, concept, policy adopted by the Naval Services wasn't first identified, discussed, debated within the pages of proceedings. Not a single one. And this debate has involved the junior most members of our profession to the senior most members of our profession, generating the ideas that will create the future fleet. I thank you for your support for that. I thank you for the support that you've given to people like me over the years who want to provide the best professional judgment to the senior most leaders in a way that is constructive, supportive, and respectful. And that's what proceedings actually provides. Now, I hold an academic chair in future warfare studies. And so obviously my job is to generate these future studies. But in reality, no person, no organization could do it as well as proceedings. Proceedings allows for the diverse ideas of our profession. I'm always surprised by numbers members of profession who aren't members of Na uh, Naval Institute, particularly flag officers aren't members of Naval Institute, because they're really missing out reading about what the future of the Navy is going to be. That future is identified in the writings in this journal. You are all critical as members of the Naval Institute for providing an opportunity for the very best ideas, better than think tanks, better than uh, many of the outside organizations. These are ideas by professionals who know what they're talking about, and who have taken the time to think, write, debate about what the best course is for the Naval Services. And you as supporters are certainly a part of that. And I urge you to join with me in thinking, debating, writing about what we think the best future is for the Naval Services and our nation. So thank you for your support and please keep reading the journal and please keep giving feedback to the authors. We all appreciate the support and we also appreciate the constructive criticism. So thank you. That concludes Seven, our Author of the Year six, and General Prize five, Essay Contest four, Awards. I'll three, now turn it back over two, to Admiral Daly. One. Well, thank you again, and congratulations to all our award winners. We're very proud of all of you. And it's now my pleasure to introduce our featured speaker, James F. Hondo Gertz, was designated as performing the duties of the Under Secretary of the Navy on February 4th, 2021. In his position, he serves as the Deputy and Principal Assistant to the Secretary of the Navy, as well as the Chief Operating Officer, Chief Management Officer for the Department of the Navy. Additionally, he oversees intelligence activities, intelligence-related activities for special access programs, critical infrastructure, and sensitive activities within the department. He has extensive joint acquisition experience, serving over 30 years in all levels of acquisition leadership positions, including acquisition executive, program executive officer, and program manager of major defense acquisition programs. Secretary Gertz previously served as Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Research Development and Acquisition from December 2017 to January of this year. Before coming to the Navy Secretariat, Hondo Gertz served as the U.S. Special Operations Command Acquisition Executive, where he was responsible for all Special Operations Forces acquisition, technology, and logistics. During this time frame, he was recognized by both private and public institutions, earning the Navy Distinguished Public Service Medal, Presidential Rank Award, U.S. SOCOM Medal, William Perry Award, and Federal Times Vanguard Award for Executive of the Year. Prior to being appointed to the Senior Executive Service, Secretary Gertz served as an officer in the U.S. Air Force, retiring after 22 years in uniform. He served as an Acquisition Program Manager, 
with engineering <coughs> and program management leadership positions in numerous weapons systems. He is a friend of the Institute and has significant naval heritage. His father and grandfather served at sea, and we welcome our keynote speaker, Secretary James Hondo Gertz. All right, thanks, Admiral Daly. It's uh, good to see uh, good to see you and the rest of the team out there. It's uh, I guess almost uh, almost 150 years in the making, and uh, and we'll talk maybe some more about it kind of in my remarks. But uh, what you and the team do here, uh, even just uh, here in uh, the recent award-winning authors, is is really really important uh, for us as a naval force, for us as a nation, and uh, and it's really my privilege to be here today. So spoiler alert: I am not going to talk. Uh, for the full amount, I will uh, maybe give some some of my thoughts, uh, experiences, uh, battle scars maybe over the last couple of years, uh, but leave plenty of time for Q and A and discussion, and uh, and I find that to be uh, very very valuable for me, and hopefully valuable for all of you out there. Uh, and to the award winners, I was talking to Admiral Daly early. You know, one of the many criticisms, uh, rightly for me, is uh, talk a lot and don't write enough, and and so I really. Um, admire the ability of, uh, the, of all of you out there who, uh, who have been writing uh, and for the Institute for publishing uh, this thought. So it's good to talk and it's good to dialogue, but uh, those really insightful papers and challenging our assumptions, challenging our ideas, challenging our preconceived notions is really critically important uh, for us as an institution and uh, for us as a naval force. Uh, as talked about in the introduction, I am a, I'm a bit of a mutt. Uh, and uh, and uh, but come from a Navy family, so my mom would just say I was confused for about 30 years, uh, uh, and so been here now almost uh, three and a half years, and it's been kind of a remarkable time, remarkable both from I would say a uh, period in our country and a period in our naval force, uh, because we're at one of those crossroads where you know we've got to make some hard decisions, we've got to challenge assumptions, and we've kind of have to set our sails for the new future. Uh, and that's always uh, daunting. Uh, it can comes with some uh, element of uh, both anticipation and fear, uh, and really challenging to do when you have a day-to-day -day mission to do. And so, as we kind of confront those challenges, it's really, really important that we all get together, talk it out, and experiment. So, you know, I'm happy to go and in Q and A, I can talk platforms or uh, weapons elevators or what it's like to be in the Pentagon. Uh, for the last couple of years or where I think the Navy is thinking in, in some areas. But I'd like to focus maybe in two sets of uh, dialogue here. And I'm a simple guy, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna kinda have three thoughts times two. Uh, and one of those is really, what do I think we need uh, in our enterprise uh, to be doing individually and collectively if we're gonna deal with this confrontation we have of what's right for the naval forces in the future. And then maybe three elements of how we might get there as kind of a broad framework. Because sometimes we get a little bit, I think, uh, we admire the specifics of should we retire this or what's this new platform gonna need. Um, but we don't think enough and talk enough about both the philosophical and the talent approach to get there. And so when I think about the force, uh, you know, I spent, time in the Air Force in the late 80s, early 90s, Desert Storm, Stealth, everything, jam, jam, jam. So then went to Special Ops in the early 2000s for the last decade plus uh, through all the wars there. Uh, and then in the Navy, and what attracted me in the Navy, and I think when we talked uh, when I first got here, I think one of my first speaking events was a USNI thing out at West. And I talked about why, why would a Air Force turned Special Ops guy be so interested uh, and honored to come to the Department of the Navy. And it's because I see, I, I run to the sound of guns. And when I think about the challenges a nation's gonna confront, uh, the naval force is gonna be a key piece of that. And you can go through history and, uh, you know, US and I's uh, steeped in all of the, the previous uh, things where we've done that. I just rely on kind of my 30 years. And when I've seen organizations that thrive in this kind of in-between, uncertain, uh, you know, a uh, uh, foot in the how we used to do things, another foot in how we might do things, I see a couple traits that have led to organizations that have been very successful in those periods 
and then organizations that haven't been so successful. And the first trait, uh, trait is both at the individual, at the unit, and at the institutional level, uh, curiosity. And curiosity being a key component. And uh, there was an interesting uh, article uh, somebody did debunking my uh, lack of skateboarding skills. But uh, the, the article talked about we don't need to have to learn how to be innovative. We have to remember how to be innovative. Because when we were all kids, curiosity wasn't a thing you learned. It was how you did everything. You know, we've all had, I've had two boys, you know, the 10,000 what, where, where did this come from? Uh, they weren't worried about what color their buddy's skin was. Or were you talking to somebody from a new town? Or what patch did you have on your, uh, on your epaulet? Or quite frankly, what rank you were? It was all about curiosity and exploring everything and not getting tied uh, to a particular concept, just always the five W's to everything. And if I think back to the special ops time in the early 2000s or back into Desert Storm time in the Air Force or the Navy in the late 30s, it was always curious, what if? What if we tried this? What can this do? Can we make this system do something it wasn't planned to do? How fast could we learn something? And so we have got to promote and encourage curiosity in us each individually uh, and as a force. And that's really e you know, easy to say for the junior officers or junior civilians or junior sailors. For us old timers, that's really hard. Um, but if we think about that and, and embrace that, that's a pretty good first step, institutionally all through to individually. The second step is then having the humility to learn. And I go back on kids. You know, when you ask your parents something or you ask your buddy something and you learned a new idea as a kid, that didn't, in, that didn't insult you personally. That didn't, you know, that didn't mean that you were a You just learned something. Wow, I never knew that. I mean, think back to the time when you were a kid and somebody told you something that just blew you away. And, but quickly your mind could reorient. Oh, okay, if that's what's true, how do we move on here? Uh, and that's, again, having that humility to learn and separating the idea or a value of an idea from our own personal beliefs uh, is critically important. Constantly challenging, why do we think that? What data gives us that evidence? Uh, just because somebody told me that, and my classic from the Air Force was, you know, because we had a problem on a B-1 bomber, the government should never be the integrator. We should outsource everything. Nobody remembers that, I mean, it's 30 years ago. I'm sure there's plenty of old sailor's tales out there. Now, there's wisdom, and we should not disrespect the wisdom, but we shouldn't be hostage to it. So if we have the curiosity to explore, the humility to learn, the third one uh, is then the boldness to act. Uh, because we can be curious and we can have lots of great ideas, but then if, if we're hesitant to act or we're hesitant to make a change or we want to study it to death, uh, we're going to be irrelevant, right? So iteration speed is really important and you can tell when you're losing to a competitor when they're iterating faster than you are. A big concern for a lot of us is how fast our competitors are iterating versus how challenged we seem to be in iterating. If we can break that and embrace boldness and value learning fast, sometimes you learn because you failed, sometimes you learn because you got an idea from somebody else. Not that smart, I'm a hell of a poacher, right? The best way to, and the best form of R&D is rip off and deploy, the SOCOM model. Somebody's already got it done, just start there. Don't have to invent it yourself. Celebrate the fact that somebody's already gotten to a point and now you're taking it on to the next part, back to that humility piece. So if we've got curiosity, we've got humility, and we've got boldness, okay, that's the traits I think we really need to be driving organizationally. Let's talk about then how do you architect that into actual action. And I think, again, us and I and everybody out here plays a really important role. Because I see, in my mind, I've kind of taken a three-step view to doing this. The first step is visioning the futures. And I put futures in parentheses, vision of possible futures. And you know that's why I love reading uh, articles and people, you know, I don't always agree with them, but I'm always informed by somebody else's vision of these. So we constantly need to have a vision of what the futures might be like. And we're probably not gonna be right. In fact, I know we won't be right. We just don't wanna be really wrong. 
And we want to, again, constantly have a number of those futures that we're thinking about, because then we can start playing our ideas and concepts against those futures and seeing how they, how they do. Competitors are always looking out in front. They're not looking back. Competitive teams are always looking forward, right? So if we can vision the possible futures, then the second step is create um, platforms that give you a lot of agility. And platforms here, I'm not talking necessarily of a weapon system platform. It could be uh, DDG-51 or something. It could be how we attack education. It could be how we recruit. It could be how we interact. And really looking for those opportunities that we create agile platforms that we can uh, stick new things on or adapt or modify really quickly without having to throw everything out. And so a great, uh, a great book, Machine Platform Crowd, is this platform thinking. I heard a couple of papers talking about thinking about software as a platform and that being the best platform, not the weapon system. Uh, but if you can apply that platform thinking and get away from kind of transactional processes to much more integrated processes, then you can get your agility up. And then the third element of the plan, I think, is just relentlessly and boldly experiment. Uh, and folks who have uh, worked for me know the first thing I rate them on is having at least one major initiative that's got a 50% chance of failing or higher. So if you out there don't have an initiative you're working on that's got at least a 50% chance of failing, you're not trying hard enough. Now, again, judgment's authorized and encouraged, so maybe not, don't pick the law or ethics or sorry, safety. But there's plenty of things we do where we can be much more aggressive at trying to learning fast, right? Learning from your buddy. If we're really good, we split up that experimentation so that everybody's experimenting and learning from each other. Uh, but then we've got to be bold in our experiment. We've got to constantly check our homework. We've got to bring in diverse voices to challenge our assumptions. We need like the USI Journal. We need folks who are out there challenging the status quo every day. Because guess what? Your competitor is doing that every day. And the fact that you don't change makes it easy money for them. Uh, because it's very easy to build a strategy against a stagnant competitor. It's really challenging to build a competitive strategy against a competitor who's changing all the time. And you guys know it, you've been on teams. You know, you didn't, it, you, even if they were an all-star team, if all they did was run the same plays every day, you knew how to defend that. The hard team was, the hard time was playing one of those teams where everybody pitched in and if you had, you know, everybody focused on the star guard and suddenly the forward's blowing you out of the, the water. And so I think if we think of the three traits I talked about and kind of this structure of constantly thinking about the future, challenge our assumptions, um, create platforms we can modify quickly and then experiment, experiment, experiment. If I go back to all the times I've seen innovation at scale and innovation in large organizations, uh, that's when it's occurred. The underlying principle for this, so has got to be talent and respect, right? You've got to have talent in there and you've got to respect, and you've got to have talent of all sorts of skills, not just talent in one uh, specific area. So that's just, you know, these ideas of respecting folks for the ideas they bring to the table, not what they look like, not what they're from, not what their gender is, not what their MO or what their uh, specialty is, uh, but for what they bring to the table towards a mission outcome. Because the thing that wraps it all together is talent, respect, and then a relentless focus on mission outcomes. Not on inputs, not how much money we're spending or how many people, it's outputs. What are you generating for the force? Uh, I think we're on that path. We've got a long way to go. I, as I've said earlier, I'm a positively discontent person. I'm uh, you know, proud of what we've done the last couple of years, but discontent that we're doing at the speed and scale we need to. That's my challenge to all of you out there. And that challenge is irrespective of politics or who's in charge of what, ain't it? That is a challenge we've got to embrace as an institution. And when an institution embraces that, at the individual, at the unit, and all the way at the highest and, and lowest levels in the organization, you can, you can get innovation at scale. Other than that, it's a bunch of niche little things, little experiments, uh, which are interesting, but they don't scare a competitor. You know, a cute little demo here, uh, one little software factory here, 
uh, one little new technology, that doesn't get a competitor to change your thinking. A competitor starts to get really concerned when they see you adapting faster than air, where you're challenging them in multiple domains, where you're putting things together that don't normally go together, uh, when you're creating effects uh, in ways that they haven't considered yet. Uh, and then they start chasing you versus us chasing a competitor. That's my challenge for all of us in the department and the Navy. Again, we're moving out in some pieces of that. We've got to do it now at scale and speed. I think if we can do that, then we've got to, then we'll continue uh, to be the dominant naval force. If we don't, we're fighting a losing game, and uh, I don't like losing. I don't think anybody out there likes to lose either. So maybe with that, some introductory comments, Admiral Daly, I'd be happy to take some Q&A. Okay, sir. Well, thank you very much. Um, so we're now going to take a few questions that have been submitted, and uh, we're continuing to take questions. And uh, the first question is submitted by Hiroaki Nakanishi. And the question is, is it possible for the U.S. to conduct maritime security operations with China, along with the Quad Plus, NATO, ASEAN member states, and regional stakeholders such as Taiwan, with an eye on reducing misunderstanding, escalatory risks among law enforcement authorities? For instance, could this be a Coast Guard thing versus a Navy thing? That yeah, question. Yeah, good, good question. I think uh, certainly allies and partners and uh, having a good dialogue even with competitors is critically important because uh, everybody fears a misunderstanding or somebody reads a signal the wrong way and you get into an escalatory uh, situation which you can't uh, which you can't control as easily, and suddenly an incident turns into a crisis and a crisis uh, spins a little bit out of control. I think the challenge is going to be, um, uh, particularly with a strong competitor, can you do that in a collaborative fashion which doesn't accede uh, the normal rights of everybody to, to keep free and open sea lanes? Uh, and to the degree you can come up with a strategy like that, it could be of interest. Uh, I would be careful not to confuse uh, participation with uh, acceding, you know, everybody's uh, ability to operate on the seas as, as we think is really important. So it would have to depend on how that was constructed. Uh, but I do think the idea of dialogue and ensuring that we don't uh, misread signals or uh, create situations where we can't control an incident uh, is also very important. Thank you. Uh, next question is submitted by Randy Blankenship. He says, first of all, thank you for your time today and your morning wake-ups on LinkedIn. With China quickly becoming a true peer competitor, do you think our Navy and the DOD in general is properly organized for the speed of technology? And are we in a Cold War organization acquisition system? Yeah, so, uh, so great question, one I'd love to spend hours talking about. Uh, interestingly, you know, I think at SOCOM, Everybody confused the speed of activity at SOCOM with unique authorities or unique, uh, you know, uh, legislation. I actually operate in the same authorities at SOCOM as we do in the Navy. And so it's not to me as much of a regulatory issue as a mindset issue. And I think uh, one of the things I learned, you know, one of the elements to really get speed is to put what are normally kind of serial processes uh, say the acquisition process. Somebody comes up with a need, then somebody writes requirements, then we have to go get money, and then somebody writes a contract, and then we build something, and then we have a training, and then doctrine. The speed at SOCOM wasn't because each one of those individual things was faster, it was that we put it in parallel. Because to me, capability is a combination of equipment, training, and tactics. And so I think the biggest thing we, and I'm starting to see it in lots of interesting ways across the Department of the Navy now, is get much more integrated so we close down the distance between the end user, the acquisition folks, and the technology folks. Down on it, if it did that rapid, uh, field something quick, discover if it works. If it works, double down on it. If it doesn't learn from it, modify the next element. But with a, with a closeness that a, a serial process doesn't allow. And so some are now having the Devrons out there and, and linking squadrons all the way back to the O5 program manager that's supporting them is really allowing us to get speed uh, in the same old process. The acquisition framework is a great framework, 
Most of the obstacles are self-inflicted and culturally reinforced. And so that's what we've got to go after and not fight the framework. The framework's very flexible. We've got to have the courage to use it to its full flexibility. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question submitted by Megan Eckstein. It says, she says, you talked about encouraging boldness and innovation. How can you recruit better uniformed and civilian employees who possess these traits when industry is also looking for these same skill sets and the same type of uh, attributes? Or can you instill these traits in the existing workforce? Um, great question, Megan. And it's curious because I met with a very senior industry uh, leader yesterday and we had this very conversation. And, and if you haven't figured out, I'm an abundance thinker, right? Instead of fighting to get a, something you don't have, figure out how to use resources you have in a new and creative way. And what we were talking about uh, on workforce and talent is, why don't we put our talent and recruiting and intern programs together? Why should a company have an intern program and the government have an intern? Why don't we create talent generation? Uh, because collectively we could generate a lot more interesting programs and a new uh, potential uh, employee could spend three months in a government shop, they could go work in a lab, they could go work in industry. And at the end, then we all kind of recruit out of that pool. So I'm, I'm, I'm viewing more like when I came in in the late 80s where the ento entire industrial base, whether government or industry, was attracting talent. We're not gonna get there by just poaching each other's talent. Uh, to your second question, absolutely, we don't have to just rinse and, re and throw out the whole current workforce. Uh, I'm always amazed when you inspire, empower, and give workforce intent what they're capable of. We've got to, we've got to create the conditions, right, where they feel safe to bring everything they have to the table to the table, because we are still suboptimized in fully embracing uh, diversity in all its dimensions. Kind of who you are, how do you think, what do you know, who do you know. And, and putting all of that to, to bear on problems. We're still not, again, on a good path, got a long way to go as we get there. Uh, we have some other issues we need to do to free up um, what I think are ideas out there and get them in the hands of folks that can use them much more quickly. It also kind of breaks down into this, how do we close distance? Uh, you know, if we had, uh, a great example is an F-18 squadron commander started working directly with our team building the next generation FLIR pod. Uh, he indicated, hey, if you could just put these two, two or three capabilities into the existing pod, that would, be, that would mean, you know, that would get us a long way uh, so I'd have uh, capability today while I'm waiting for the next block two. I don't want to wait five or six years for the next block two. That was actually a fairly easy thing for the team to do. They did it in a couple weeks. We got it out there in the fight. And so I think part of it also is back to this really rewarding folks and creating incentives where curiosity is valued, where taking appropriate risk is valued, where taking bold action and trying something is valued. Uh, because I still sense we have some latent capacity in our organization, which we've got to unleash. And then the third piece to talent is also uh, fully leveraging talent we have not accessed to the full measure, whether that's in startups or non-traditional businesses or commercial businesses. Uh, and so, I, you know, I think there's a multiple dimension, a multi-dimension approach we need to take as we go after this. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, next question is submitted by Bill Hamblett, our editor-in-chief of Proceedings. Can you highlight the Navy's progress on electric weapons, including high-power lasers, high-power microwaves, electromagnetic rail guns? How, do you, how soon do you think we'll see these deployed operation and operational on our ships? Yeah, thanks, Phil. Um, so I think you're seeing this occurring in, in two kind of dimensions simultaneously. Um, one of the things when folks talk about the Ford aircraft carrier that gets a lot of press, right? The uh, electromagnetic, uh, you know, resting gear, launching gear, uh, new radar and all that. What's really interesting to me, one of the really interesting int things to me on Ford is it's got three, time the power, three times the power capacity of a Nimitz, right? And it's got a lot more adaptability to things we're either near inventing or inventing in the future. So we've got to, I think, attack this in, in one, making sure we create uh, you know, space, weight, power in our future platforms to take advantage of technologies as they come about. And then again, we've got to be relentless on the boldly experimenting and find, find the ones that are going to make a difference and the ones that aren't. 
As you know, we've got Odin laser systems now going on destroyers. Uh, we've got high power lasers. We're now getting out in the fleet uh, because not only do we have to get the technology ready, we've got to work through the tactics and the training to make that a usable capability. And so I'm focused on, similarly on the unmanned stuff, there's a technology element to unmanned or re remotely piloted, but then there's a whole bunch of other elements we're trying to get our arms around. So that when the technology's ready, we don't wait and then get delayed while we think about these other problems, uh, like how are we gonna train, how are we gonna maintain it, what are the concepts of operation, uh, how do you deal with policies like law of armed conflict, all those kinds of things. We need to be working those in parallel so the second the technology is ready, we can turn it into an operational capability. So progress is being made there. Uh, I think it's gonna open up some new avenues for us, but we've gotta to continue to be bold uh, and, and keep getting at it. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question was submitted by Cedric Chital. And uh, Mr. Secretary, you talked earlier about innovation and casting a wide net. What could be the role of allies of the U.S. Navy in this daunting innovative thinking that you want to inspire in the team? Yeah, so I, I, absolutely critical. One of my uh, uh, secrets at SOCOM was, uh, was that we thought about our allies and partners in much in technology development and new ways of employing as we did in fighting on the battlefield or working diplomacy. Because in many cases, you're seeing the problem if you're an ally, you're seeing the same problem, but maybe from a different perspective or you have a different view of it, or maybe you haven't got a $200 billion a year budget, and so you've got to be really creative and leverage something in a new way. And a lot of the best ideas I found at SOCOM were, again, back to rip off and deploy, you know, finding them with close partners and allies. And so I think that's, it's been true all through history. I'm sure US and I can give you thousands of hedgehog examples and other areas where there's been great um, innovation that's occurred uh, what we need to do on the U.S. side, one is to be open to it, and then secondly, back to this kind of platform thinking, and again, not, not platform as a, as a weapon system, just a philosophical, so that we have the business, the technical, and the operational architectures that can take advantage of an opportunity when it presents itself. Big bureaucracies tend to be very, they're over infatuated with managing risk, and they're underinvested in leveraging opportun opportunities. So when I think of um, institutional innovation, back Air Force, late 80s, uh, Navy, 1930s, um, SOCOM, early 2000s, it was a forward-looking opportunistic mindset, uh, an abundance mindset. They didn't care where the idea came from. They didn't care who invented it. If it could help and generate an outcome, they were forward-leaning to be able to drag that in and get it into the fight quickly. We would mature weapons in combat because that was faster than waiting to go through a five-year development program. We would prove they're safe. We would prove they'd have a minimum effectiveness. Then we'd get them downrange because that was the fastest way to get through the maturity cycle. So allies and partners uh, bring great, um, I think, opportunity to us where we, uh, we've invested some. I think we've got more and more opportunity to get there. You know, it's really hard for a competitor to deal with allies and partners that are learning from each other uh, and are mixing matches, mixing and matching forces quickly and concepts and learning quickly. That is a, that is a competitive advantage we will always have if we've got the courage to use it. Uh, particularly a non-democratic um, <clears throat> competitor, they can compel somebody, they can coerce somebody, but they can't inspire somebody they can't enable somebody the way we can on the Democratic side. So as you're seeing the, I would say, maturity of thinking between the Navy and the Marine Corps and the Coast Guard, and now you're going to start seeing it, I think, out of WARCOM, of not only how do we operate as a naval force together, you know, we, it was a little bit more like deconfliction and synchronizing. Now, how do I take the inherent um, benefits that 25,000 Marines on the first island chain give me that enable the Navy to do something different or better? Or how can the Navy enable the Marine Corps to operate? Or how can the Coast Guard um, bring in a new way of thinking? Not just to split up the work, but make every, each element of the work that much more effective and that much more vexing for a competitor. As we think about this, 
That's what allies and partners also bring to the table, uh, again, if we are forward-leaning and opportunistic in our mindset. Thank you, sir. Uh, speaking of allies and partners, this question submitted by James Chespie. This question is, how do you envisage the relationship with the Royal Navy in particular with respect to interoperability? Yeah, it's great. I mean, I, I personally spent a lot of time with the first and second Sea Lord, uh, even in the, in, in the most immature of the innovation space, because we see opportunities to be even interchangeable or interoperable in the way we think of problems, much less on the solution side. I mean, all you got to look at it right now is the you know, Queen Elizabeth, uh, Marine Corps jets were the things that certified the flight deck and they're splitting up the flight deck as they go on their first deployment. And so this idea, I know the Sea Lord's idea of interchangeability, again, powerful idea. If we can mix and match forces dynamically, that prevent, pre presents really challenging problems for a competitor. How do you, now instead of having to deal with, well, I'm gonna have you know this uh, country's force here and this country's force here, now I've got this, this mosh pit of forces that are mixing and matching and bringing their unique capabilities, talents, and skills to the table. Again, creates a lot of uncertainty, creates new problems for the competitor, and then they're spending their time trying to figure out how to deal with our strategy versus us spending our time trying to chase them. So I think, I think what the U.S. Uh, Navy and the Royal Navy have done, and same on the Marine Corps side, is a good guidepost for how we need to continue to do that. Similarly with the Australians, we have the largest, uh, I think the first year ever, we've gone over a billion dollars of competitive or co cooperative development programs together. So not only are we uh, making it cheaper because we're inventing it once and using it multiple times, we're getting output that neither nation could do on their own. And, and so I think that is, again, one of our enduring competitive advantages we've got to fully exploit. Thank you, sir. Uh, this one's submitted by Mark Clemente. It says, Congress is pushing back on the Navy's future vision implying that the Navy is neglecting near-term problems to prioritize high-risk solutions to open-ended challenges. And I'd like to piggyback on that and say that there's clearly nervousness about the uh, unmanned piece and uh, a vibrant debate about legacy systems, what to keep, what not to keep. Uh, can you talk about that? Yeah, I'm gonna maybe take one step back uh, because I think in many times we create this as an us versus them, or you know we need to enlighten them to our brilliance, or, or vice, and we make it um, almost this confrontational. Uh, and you know the, the folks on the hill, uh, the PSMs that have been working there, they've been tracking us for a long time. They are steeped in a lot of the activities we're doing. They bring a unique perspective. They've seen you know 10 years ago we tried something. Uh, and maybe didn't think it all the way through, and then uh, we're sub-optimizing our response. So the first thing I would say is, um, you know, our transparency and working together to think through the problems is a key, as opposed to, you know, being kind of confrontational in it. Uh, secondly, we've got to make sure we are confident in the things we know, and transparent in the things that we don't know or have to go discover. Uh, because that uh, enables credibility. In my, mind, in my mind, credibility enables freedom of action. And so if we're not credible because we haven't thought our way through a problem or we're whitewashing a problem, uh, then Congress rightly should be uh, asking us the hard questions. And if we can't answer those hard questions, then we need to get after that work. What I would say on the legacy versus modern is that is a really challenging problem, uh, particularly in a resource-constrained environment. And there's gonna be perspectives on, on all sides of the fence there. Uh, but just like a car in your driveway, at some point, uh, the analogy I used last week is, you know, I had a piano, which I loved, and it was a beautiful piano, and it was an old 110-year-old upright, but it was getting about 10 maintenance man hours for every one playing hour. And eventually, as much as I loved that piano, uh, I was spending more time fixing the piano and, and not doing other things. And so there is a natural time, I think, uh, for some of these platforms, and that chasing it with people, time, energy, dry docks, all that uh, becomes a diminishing resource. We've got to be able to show why we think that uh, and then have credibility in executing the programs we have going forward. So I think the real solution to that uh, is continue the transparency elements of it uh, and make sure that we are thinking through all the problem, all the problems and taking advantage of 
the criticisms or the hard questions to continue to up our game and make it better and better and better, uh, as opposed to um, just believing that we have a static answer and that answer is good. Ultimately, our ability to change faster than our competitor, our ability to adapt faster than our competitor, our ability to create solutions that are more resilient uh, is, is, I think, a key concept of how we've got to transform. If we create a program that's so brittle, one change to the threat or one change to a mark or one change to a maintenance availability or one change to an operational uh, scenario makes the whole plan fall apart, then I don't think we've got the force we really need going into the future. So all of you out there who are studying this, who are much, much, much more steeped in naval strategy and how to think through those problems, those are what I'm interested in. How do you create a resilient and adaptable force uh, that we can, instead of being hostage to change, leverage it as our competitive advantage? Uh, and I think that will be another key as we think about the naval force we need uh, we are going to be stuck with a lot of the force we have right now. Uh, so uh, some of that is making the most out of the force we have and using it in new and creative ways. Um, but ultimately, if we can't defend that uh, and talk plainly about uh, what, what we're doing to the American people, to the Hill, uh, to other folks in the building, to ourselves, uh, then I don't think we've done our homework. And that's what I'm counting on everybody out there to help with. Thanks, sir. Uh, this question submitted by Hunter Styers. He says, Secretary Gertz, thank you for speaking to us today. And one of the dynamics that has been identified as driving the Navy's procurement challenges over the past two decades has been the shift from designing ships and other platforms in-house toward increased outsourcing of the design process to industry. Could you speak to what insights the Navy shipbuilding and acquisition enterprise can derive from Secretary Roper's recent successes of designing in-house, building, and flying a prototype for the Air Force's next generation air dominance in less than a year? Yeah, so um, one of the reasons, and I, I've said this openly before, I came to the Department of the Navy was because we had the best organic talent in the Department of Defense. More than 30,000 scientists, engineers, uh, program managers, logisticians. We have got the organic talent and we've leveraged it to great effect. Many folks don't know at SOCOM, most of the software I put on our combat systems was written by Navy engineers. So there's incredible talent out there uh, and we've got to find the right place to introduce them into the system. Uh, and I think the way the Navy is approaching on many of the ship side, uh, splitting out the combat systems and the sensors and the weapons from the ship uh, builders is a, is a good start to that. Uh, and I think the Navy's got lots of great successes in designing things in house uh, and getting them out there quickly. There's certainly more opportunities to go do that. Uh, and again, that goes back to this, uh, a lot of our focus on creating the technical architecture, the business architecture, and the operational architecture where we can leverage a great idea no matter where it comes from. Whether it's in-house engineering, whether it's uh, uh, two folks in their garage, whether it's an ally or partner, whether it's a commercial enterprise, uh, or whether it's a sailor or a marine on the deck plate level. Uh, and I found if we can create an opportunistic architecture in all those dimensions, then we can fully leverage everything we're doing in-house to great effect. There's always a need, I think, uh, for industry, uh, for scale. Uh, governments tend to prototype well. And so what's worked well for me in the past is prototype really quickly on government house and then figure out how to turn over to industry to do it at scale uh, because they can bring the optimization there and then fully leverage small business to continually prime the pump of innovation. Uh, that's what we're trying to organize uh, within the Department of the Navy. So this is the final question uh, submitted by Kurt Nelson. And with a focus on more rapidly deploying new systems and software, doing a more rapid deployment, how can we ensure that our sailors have the appropriate training and materials and opportunities to maximize the new capabilities required for competent and effective employment? Yeah, really, really good question, and, uh, and uh, I thank you. It's, uh, one of the things that when I first came here, I was really concerned with the Department of Navy. We didn't really have a go-to-war plan, not on how are we going to fight, how are we going to support it from the acquisition side, how are we going to mobilize, how are we going to uh, spare, how are we going to provide tech assist in a combat environment. And so we started thinking on that, and then this last year and change of COVID, a, what I think a positive byproduct from that 
has been the self-sufficiency I've seen out of sailors and ships and crews across the Navy has really gone up. Uh, and we've um, got away from the only way to solve a problem is send an FSR out there uh, and wait a couple days. Figuring out how to do tele-engineering or tele-maintenance or get better training material out to the sailors and Marines, how to have the right stock at the right place. So when I think about the Navy going forward, I don't want to return to where we were last March. If we do that, to me, that's mission failure. We failed as leaders if our site picture is returning to where we were. What we need to do is take all the things we've learned, all the self-sufficiency we've generated in the force, all this adaptability, what everybody out there has done. You know, we didn't shut down a shipyard for a day on any private, public, or public shipyard for the entire period of COVID. And you know, it's great we celebrate our heroes in uniform. If you're a, if you're a shipbuilder out there, you're as much a hero as anybody else in this. Because it, what it showed us is we all need to be working together on this. Uh, and we've got to get out of this kind of transactional, very brittle view of the world and build in resilience and adaptability. And back to the early question about talent, you can learn that. You don't have to be born with it. You can practice that before you need it. And so when I think of the Navy going forward in the future, it's not last March. It's where we are times two or three X because we can leverage all of that great learning, what we've done, got sets and reps in, how we've overcome challenges, how we've dealt with things at the personal level or at the unit level or at the institutional level. Pretty good training, uh, been really hard on you. So my last, I guess, before I get off the stage here, and I say, try and say it every talk, you know, reaching out for help is a sign of strength. Mental Health Month, you've seen the sector, you've seen the CNO. Uh, I don't care where you are, you're all part of the team, whether you're in industry, academia, uh, on the shipyard, out to sea. Um, never get in a position where you feel like you can't reach out for help. Uh, because again, if we're gonna compete and win at the global scale, we've gotta be able to rely on each other, we've gotta trust each other, we gotta know everybody's got each other backs. And when you need a hand, and we all need a hand, I'll be the first one to, uh, to raise mine, uh, we can't be afraid to reach out uh, and get a little help. So, uh, Admiral Daly, with that, thanks for the great questions and thanks for uh, the opportunity to talk with you. Thanks, sir. I'm going to join you in your spot here and say thanks. You know, Woody thanks. Allen said that 60% of life is showing up. Yep. And thank you for showing up. Oh, us. Awesome. We truly appreciate it. And the time you took to come over here and engage with our audience and work the Q's and A's. And uh, before I sign off for the audience, I just want to give one more shout out to the Naval Institute staff who showed tremendous resiliency and hard work We're here for the annual on our mission this year. And I want to thank our members and all our viewers here for the annual meeting for joining us for this 148th annual meeting of the United States Naval Institute. Awesome. Thank you. Well done. And good night. Thanks, sir. All right. on you, you can count on us. To build the impossible, to invent the inconceivable, and solve every problem with speed and reliability. Every mission is an expedition of the greatest importance, both to you and to us.